Hi, my name is Karen Lau, and I'm the International Student Advisor for the College of Engineering and Computer Science. I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Um, I'll be the moderator for a student panel consisting of three ECS students from the Engineering Ambassadors Network Program. Now this program that we call EAN for short is a student professional development organization that helps students to develop soft skills, including oral presentation skills, leadership skills, and social networking skills. And today the students that we have on our panel will present some presentations that they've been working on over the past semester, followed by a time of Q&A. And I'd like to introduce you now to these particular students. First, we have Crystal Quintanar, who is a third year computer engineering major. We also have Marina Soleman, who is a third year mechanical engineering. And with us, we also have Ricardo Martinez, who is a senior and computer science major. We're extremely grateful for the students for the time that they've taken to be with us today. And we're so grateful for all of you who have decided to join us as well. So we'll start by having the student presentations followed by the Q&A. And I'd like to invite Ricardo Martinez to share his screen. And Ricardo will talk to us a little bit about EAN, um, his involvement in this particular program, and then he, he will transition into his presentation on machine learning. Thank you, Karen. So again, my name is Ricardo Martinez. I am a senior at Cal State Fullerton, and I am majoring in computer science. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about engineering, uh, EAN, Engineering Ambassador Networks. Uh, it is what the name stands for, which is uh, engineers. We're ambassadors that represent uh, engineering at Cal State Fullerton, and we're networking with each other. But aside from that, it's a double-edged sword. So we not only get to go to our community and talk about our engineering majors, myself as personally, personally is software engineering, which is under the umbrella of computer science, but we also get to practice our soft skills and presentation skills as well. So we benefit from the practice, but we also allow our community to benefit from us because we're introducing them into our specific field of engineering and hopefully enticing younger students um, uh, on a path that they might not have been able to explore on their own. So besides being able to have the opportunity to have a scholarship, um, which is great, it's an added bonus, you get to network and meet professionals that can be helpful in your work field, whether you're a computer engineer, mechanical engineer, software engineer, um, the ability to network in a professional sense this early on in your career is it's, it's, it's very crucial. It's crucial to how your job search will be going on after school. For myself personally, because of the networking I've been able to do, it's allowed me to make connections and help interview. Um, specifically with Karen and Dr. O and having that professional connection if I were to need it. Um, but again, Engineering Ambassador Network is just to help us and let our community explore um, regarding the engineering pathways that they can take here at Cal State Fullerton. So a presentation I've been able to prepare through EAN uh, is a choice of mine, which is machine learning and how it's used in our everyday life. Many of us have our laptops and cell phones and other electronic devices on us on a daily basis. Um, what we don't realize is how these companies use machine learning in order to affect our daily life. So for instance, something I use on a daily basis for the past 12 years, and I'm sure you use it on a daily basis as well, is YouTube. And YouTube is one of the big tech companies that uses machine learning. Although you might not know right as of right now how it relates to what you do, I'm gonna walk you through it and be able to grasp and understand how YouTube is able to use machine learning. Specifically, what we're gonna to cover today is three things. The first one is how it knows and what video you wanna watch. I'm sure you've been on the website and the recommendations are similar to your interests or what you've been talking about. And then secondly, what we're gonna be talking about is the misconceptions. A lot of people think machine learning is an actual machine or robot that's learning and being self-conscious and is gonna take over the world. 
Thirdly, we're going to cover why it matters and how it affects your everyday life. Again, this is something we interact with on a, on a day-to-day -day basis, right? at least for myself personally. Um, it's not only on YouTube, it's on other applications, Instagram, or any Google search you might do. But again, we're just going to be covering today's uh, YouTube aspect on machine learning. And again, as we said, we're going to be covering YouTube's uh, aspect. What better example than to be going with YouTube's homepage recommendations. So these videos that you see on your home feed is based on your previous search history. So for instance, if you're in middle school or coming into high school or a high schooler going into college, you're gonna be searching videos uh, regarding high school or whatever that might be. And as this input gets taken into the cache, which is basically data stored on the website, it's gonna slowly take this information and build a rapport on all your uh, searches and start recommending videos regarding what you're searching, as we can see here on the homepage. So as you go on, more and more videos get highlighted and recommended through the machine learning algorithm. This sees your videos and it sees what you're interested in and it starts pulling, building up the playlist in order to recommend. And depending on your clicks and views and how long you view it for is uh, how the videos are chosen. So if we can see here on this homepage from YouTube, uh, we can see that we're recommended a famous blogger, blogger, his name is David Dobrik. And then that's him right here. If you were to choose this video and then click on the actual video and look through it, we can see on the right side that the machine learning algorithm learns your interests and starts pushing channels with similar content because we don't wanna be bored with the same person, the same video over and over again. So what it actually does is as you click a video and as other and hundreds of thousands of other viewers click that video as well, it starts uh, building up a network per se. Think about, it, uh, think about it as a spider web and on there it connects all the channels and videos that other people like. And depending on how long they've seen the video for, whether they like it or not, it starts recommending all those to you. And that's basically how the machine learning algorithm starts recommending the videos. So it would continue on and then go on and on and on. And it'll enthrall us into a plethora of videos where you endlessly mind, mindlessly watch as well. Um, the way they make their money is at the beginning of every video, they have ads depending on the length of the video. Um, but basically that's how they make their money is on your attention and how long you stay on the actual video. So that's why machine learning is so crucial for them. But we might not know exactly how uh, machine learning might work, but to give you an idea of how it's built, it's built by developers or programmers, they could all be named the same way. They're typically programmed uh, to have single methods of completion. It could be to tell you whether uh, it's night or day or it's raining outside or whatever program you might be uh, doing. So what machine learning does differently than an actual program is machine learning takes multiple variables. And we'll just do an example here. For the first variable, we have a search of Fortnite, which is a video game if you're not too familiar with it. And then the second bit uh, variable is the search of the best Fortnite streamers. And as it takes these variables in, it starts doing some calculations. These calculations uh, start taking in the report built from other uh, viewers clicking on the actual video, and it starts building a network. On this network, it builds a percentage of which one it thinks you're gonna be able to choose and click on the longest. It'll tell you 90%, uh, 20%, or if it thinks you're not gonna like it, 60%. And what we do, uh, depending on the variables, is the way it sets up the playlist and the, the actual list. So we'll do another example. For instance, we have Tom Holland here. Tom Holland uh, played Spider-Man. If you're not too familiar with, that's our first variable. Our second variable, uh, we have Jimmy Kimmel here. And then as this goes on, it's going to do the math again, check on the viewer on the viewer clicks and how long it actually stayed on the videos. And it's going to start giving you a percentage again on what it thinks you're going to like more 
versus what it thinks you're not gonna like. And so depending on which one has the highest probability, it's gonna actually rank it from first to second. And that's how the video playlist on your right-hand side when you're watching YouTube is actually made. So one of the biggest things that people miss take from machine learning is the misconceptions of how it's gonna affect us. And as a filmmaker, you wanna be able to captivate the audience, the audience's attention by fear-mongering. And what better way of fear-mongering machine learning than to have people think that they're gonna go rogue and they're gonna kill us. And if you're old enough, I'm sure you've seen iRobot or Terminator where Skynet takes over. And then just to give you a quick observation of how it works, uh, I'm gonna show this video here. Please let me know if you can hear it. Detective, what are you doing? Well, you said they bought me a program with the three laws. So that means we have 1,000 robots that will not try to protect themselves if it violates a direct order from a human. I'm betting one who will. Detective, put your gun down. Why do you give them faces? Friendly them all up, make them look all human. These robots are not susceptible to intimidation. Well, I guess if you didn't, we wouldn't trust them. These robots are USR property. Not me. These things are just lights and clockwork. <laughs> Let me ask you something, Doc. You thinking you're the last sane man on the face of the earth to make you crazy? Because if it does, maybe I am. Get the hell out of here! So just to relate back to that video, basically what he was inciting is that these robots are programmed to only do as we tell it. But the fear mongering that was done there from the filmmakers is that that robot went rogue and had its own consciousness and then was able to make actions and decisions on its own without being told. Uh, we also have here an IG-11 robot. If you're familiar with Star Wars and, plan and follow the Mandalorian, uh, this was a hunt droid specifically made to go kill uh, Grogu or Baby Yoda, whichever one you know it as. But after it was destroyed in a battle, it was rebuilt and that rebuild process was uh, forcing it to only be a nurse droid. And that's the truth about robots is they can only do what we program it to do. And they don't have self-conscious, even though machine learning might make it seem that way. One of the benefits though, is that machine learning in our uh, actual real world sense is continually improving the quality of our life and it's allowing us to connect in a way that information is sent rapidly. And although it might seem negative in a sense, it has a more general positive uh, outlook towards it. it. It allows us to give factual information on our medicine and what's going on. And then this actually gives us the ability to help us in, in case we were to need uh, medication or any type of uh, area that needs quality upbringing in our life. So the applications of machine learning have rapidly exponentially advanced and it's gonna continue to do so within the last five to 10 years. What's capable now seemed inconceivable then. And I assure you within five years from today, you're gonna be blown away with what we're able to do with uh, technology. And then I know that was a lot to grasp and kind of understand and follow, uh, but just to give you a quick synopsis of everything that we went through is that the usefulness of machine learning is essential for every business, whether tech or not, and allowing us to connect with the guests and the clients and uh, keep that retention. We also went over the misconceptions and fears that most filmmakers and media uh, like to use because it allows them to get the clicks and the views and bring viewer attention to themselves, even though it might not be true. And then also the information of how it can uh, help us finding uh, medical procedures or whatever that might be, or save us from financial hardships. And if you have any questions, please do let me know. And a quote I really enjoy is, don't let the digital supply chain scare you. It means uh, don't be scared of the future and technology and what it has to offer us. If we use it ethically, we'll definitely improve the quality of our lives.
So that was my presentation. I'm now going to be passing it back to Karen, and she's going to be uh, giving us our second presentation. Thank you so much, Ricardo. I really appreciate you sharing your presentation. We'll now turn it over to a group presentation with Crystal and Marina, and they will uh, now share their screen to share with us what they've been working on over the past semester. Hi everyone, my name is Crystal Quintanar and I'm a third year computer engineering major here at Cal State Fullerton. I picked Cal State Fullerton because I come from a smaller town on the central coast. And for me, I was looking more for a campus that, had, that was more community-based. And I found that at uh, CSUF. Uh, so I'm in two programs. I'm in the university's honor, honors program. And what I liked about Cal State Fullerton in the beginning uh, was just knowing that the student to faculty ratio is already pretty small. And in the university honors program, it's even smaller in terms of class size. So when doing your GEs, you can expect anywhere from 10 to 15 students in your class. And that makes talking to your professor and getting to know your classmates uh, a lot less intimidating. And I'm also in the engineering ambassadors network. So as an engineering ambassador, I got to meet uh, others, uh, other students who are also very passionate about engineering. Um, and we all come from different backgrounds and it's really, uh, it's been a really great opportunity to meet, you know, so many amazing people and be able to uh, talk about our similar interest and just know that we're passionate about the same things. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Marina Solomon. I'm also a third year undergraduate at Kent State Fullerton. I'm studying mechanical engineering. To add on to what Crystal said about uh, the engineering department in Cal State Fullerton, it's also one of the top uh, engineering schools in California, and it has many programs to help uh, new students to succeed and get their bachelor as an ECS peer mentor and the tutoring center that's always open during school hours uh, to help the student uh, uh, in difficult courses as physics, math, and many others. Also, the mechanical department have a, a lot of uh, program and clubs as the uh, Titan Rover, American Society of Mechanical Engineer, and uh, the Women in Engineering Club and the IN program that we're part of. And today in our presentation, before we start, I want you guys to take a minute to picture a bridge in your mind. I'm going to take a guess that for some of you may have been the Golden Gate Bridge from San, from San Francisco came to your mind, or maybe it was a Tower Bridge from London. Whichever bridge you thought of, I'm sure no one in this meeting thought of the highway bridge that were always used on a daily basis to get from point A to point B. Um, there is a more about there is about uh, 600,000 bridges in the U.S. alone, and each and every bridge of these uh, bridge require an inspection every two years to ensure that there is no cracks, rusting, or other damages. And that means that every day around 800 bridges needs to be an inspection. And in our presentation, we will talk about health monitoring of bridge destruction using drones. Today we will talk about how drones are more efficient in detecting bridge failures. First, we will talk about the reasons behind bridge failures. Then we will discuss how several engineers with detecting bridges in the past. Lastly, we will encounter the new way, which is mechanical engineers and computer engineers invented to solve the bridge inspection problems. First, we will start about, to talk about the three main reasons that cause bridge failures. The first reason is natural disaster. As we all see in the image shown in front of us, the bridge was damaged by a powerful flood. And the second reason is, uh, is bridge's design criteria. Every bridge is different and therefore has different design standards. And in the image shown, uh, a truck attempt to cross a bridge that eventually wasn't suitable for its size and leading to the bridge failure. The third reason uh, is design failure, which happened because the bridge wasn't designed correctly. 
As we see in the picture, only the left fragment of the bridge collapsed, implying that an error existed in that section. So what is structural health monitoring? Well, structural health monitoring is the practice of monitoring the, uh, the condition of a structure. And let's use the example of going to the doctor. Before going to the doctor, you need to have some type of symptoms, whether it's your because your stomach uh, hurts or maybe it's your head. So then you make an appointment, you go to the doctor. And when you go, you sit there and you tell them what's wrong with you. And uh, they try, and then the doctor then di diagnoses you. And then finally, the doctor provides you with some type of prescription or um, or with some type of medication or treatment to help you make you to help make you feel better. And this is pretty similar to the process of structural health monitoring. So first, there has to be a need for improvement on the bridge. And then the inspectors and engineers go ahead and look at the problematic area to see what needs to be fixed or how it needs to be fixed. And then that's when the bridge goes under construction and those fix and those improvements are then made. So I'm sure many of you have played with slime. And I'm sure that if you've played with slime, you've pulled the slime far, uh, far enough to where uh, it eventually snaps. Well, when we think about a bridge, the reason for why it snaps is because you're applying a tension force uh, onto the slime. So as you can see, there's the compression force uh, where the red arrows are in the image and they're pushing inward and that, te and that tension force is pushing out. And then of course, there's other, um, other forces on the bridge that could come from uh, the weight of cars, people walking across and cyclists. So in this GIF that you'll see in front of you, uh, this, this uh, incident could have easily been prevented uh, if, <clears throat> if, the, uh, if the bridge was inspected sooner. Uh, so this actually occurred in Miami, Miami, Florida about two years ago, and it killed several people and, injure, and injured several others. And it was later, uh, found that there was stress in the concrete of the bridge, which doesn't cause it to collapse the way that it did. So engineers and inspectors face high, risk, face high risks every day while monitoring the health of the bridge. And there's three main factors. One is that it's very time consuming. So monitoring a bridge can take anywhere from several weeks to several months. And it's extremely dangerous as you can see in the picture in front of you. Um, the inspectors need to, to take into consideration uh, weather conditions and the environment in which the bridge is. And it's very expensive, which contributes to how it's dangerous and time consuming. Um, because as I said, it's a, it's a very uh, timely uh, process when um, human observation is used. And in the next slide, I'm gonna show you a video uh, that provides us that, use, that shows how drones provide a solution to these three issues that I just mentioned. We are doing a bridge inspection on the Daniel Carter Beard Bridge here between Kentucky and Ohio. We're doing a rope access inspection and we are supplementing that with our UAS. Today we're performing an inspection of the Stone Arch Bridge, finishing the underwater inspection of the bridge, and also performing an inspection of the bridge with a drone. The Stone Arch Bridge is definitely an icon for the city of Minneapolis, probably one of the most historically significant bridges in the state. A typical bridge inspection, especially something complex like that structure, it requires a lot of man hours, hands-on inspection, takes a lot of time. Therefore, it takes a lot of capital cost for states. So if we can save them some time and inspect that with the Intel technology, that's our main purpose out here. It's not that automation is going to reduce workforce. You still have to send people to go fix it. But this is huge in terms of safety and to know when to fix, how to fix, and then the people are going to be able to have the time to work on the real problems that they need to look at. So as we, as we saw in the video, the uh, bridge inspection is very necessary for our safety and for the structure usage, but it's very dangerous, time consuming and expensive. But with the implementation of new technology, which is drones, 
bridge and inspection will be taken to another level. And drones are known to be as a flying robot that can be controlled by a remote or uh, autonomously con uh, through a software. And the usage of drones have been increasing rapidly in many industrial fields as agriculture, trade, military, but it's mostly used in the infrastructure sector. 37% of the drone usage is used in the talking bridges. Right now, every single picture you guys see in a, uh, in Google Maps or any direction apps are taken by a drone. And 70% of the surveying have been done using drones as well. And surveying is like collecting data about miles, distance, and locations. Also, 50% of the U.S. bridges have been inspected by drones. Right now, some of you might ask, what's the consequences of human uh, inspection and how a machine are more efficient than humans? In the past, engineers used to encounter high-risk situations in order to perform a structural health monitoring. And, and one of the main, uh, one of the important issue with human inspection is its dangers. And an inspection of such bridges requires a crew of professional uh, uh, heavy machines and people rappelling from dangerous heights. And drone makes in, uh, bridge inspection uh, safer for engineers and construction workers. So and it says a worker clumped to the bridge, we send a drone to fly to the indicated point and record all the necessary data and then get back to the ground and uh, several engineers use all the data to analyze the bridge. An estimate shown that the number of potentially life-threatening accidents in average construction sites was reduced by 91% uh, when drone monitoring was used. So, and also the <clears throat> with drones, the government is pending it's going to be dropped. So the government will not have to pay any more for the bridge inspection inspectors. And the salary for bridge inspectors are about $30 per hour. And the biannual inspection cost is $2.7 billion in the U.S. Uh, so with the use of drone, civil engineer will only need to buy only one drone and pay for the wages of uh, one inspector. And right now, Crystal will tell us more about the features that make drones more efficient in inspecting bridges. So drones utilize a, a variety of software that can be very useful in the inspection and reconstruction process. Um, and using a drone actually reduces, um, it takes about approximately 20 minutes to go around a structure and it reduces time by 25% uh, compared to human observation. And um, some and some software catches, um, or the software that these drones utilize um, are able to are able to capture time lapse videos um, and take high resolution photos that uh, where inspectors and engineers can then analyze the data that the drone had collected and see where those problem areas are and then take the next steps into fixing them. Um, and drones, with their with their with their cameras, they can take these ortho photos and um, in manipulating how the how the photos are used with the software. Uh, these ortho photos are able to create a 3D, uh, it geometrically constructs a 3D surface. Um, and this is very useful in the reconstruction process um, after fixing those problem areas in the bridge. So the drones also offer a variety of, or they use a variety of sensors. Um, so they use accelerometers, as you can see at the top, um, and these are used to determine the uh, position and orientation of the drone while it's in flight. They use a, a inertial measurement units or IMU and combined with the GPS, it's, maintain, it's critical for maintaining uh, the flight path. And um, this works with the software in the sense that drones can actually be pre-programmed so they can save even more time um, in terms of how their flight path is then created by an engineer um, so that it knows exactly what areas need to be looked at first and get the job done much quicker. 
They also have tilt sensors um, and these work in correlation with the accelerometers. And what they do is they maintain the stability of the drone because as I mentioned, it needs to be able to take these high resolution images and these time-lapse videos that can later, later on be analyzed. And it's not labeled on here, but they also have thermal or infrared um, sensors that make it possible to, uh, to collect uh, radiometric data um, in hard to reach places that, um, or in capture in uh, hard to reach places that uh, can't be ob observed by the human eye. So to sum up, uh, what I just uh, talked about is that drones have uh, cameras that offer um, high resolution high resolution photos and time lapse videos that can later be analyzed. Um, they have accelerator ac accelerometers that work in correlation uh, with GPS to monitor the longitude, latitude, and elevation point. They have thermal sensors um, that collects the radiometric data. And they also have software that can be manipulated. And as I mentioned, plans the flight paths and events. So to conclude, uh, what we've covered, we've discussed how um, or some of the reasons why uh, that caused bridge failures. We've also discussed uh, what structural health monitoring is and how its practice is, um, is being used and reformed and how drones are providing a solution to the issues that we mentioned about how uh, human observation is costly, dangerous, and very expensive. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you, Crystal and Marina. Appreciate your presentation. Why don't we open it now up to a section of this session where we will have a student panel. So Crystal, Marina, and Ricardo, um, I have a couple of questions prepared. Um, then I would like to um, ask for your responses to help inform future ECS students um, about ECS experience from a student perspective. So we'll start with the first question. The first question is, what factors impacted your decision to attend Cal State Fullerton? And for this, why don't we start with Ricardo and then Crystal and then Marina? Yeah, of course. Um, so I'm a transfer student. I started in community college first um, and I had looked at multiple colleges. I went to all the UCs. Um, checked all the Cal States as well. And uh, there were three main uh, reasons that affected my decision on where I was going and specifically Cal State Fullerton. So again, as a transfer student from community college, uh, number one was finance uh, and how uh, cost-effective uh, transferring to a Cal State uh, was. And so far, I don't want to give uh, actual numbers in case they differ from myself to you, but from finances, this was the most cost effective uh, way and decision for me to attend a university in comparison to uh, the universities like UCI, UCR, just to throw some names out there. And it was also the most uh, closest to me from my hometown, um, which is why I went to Cal State Fullerton instead of another CSU. Um, secondly, the main thing I wanted to see from the schools is their student to professor ratio. And one of the big things that a lot of my friends that had attended other uh, UCs or CSUs were that they felt like they weren't even being taught from professors, that they felt like they were being taught by uh, TAs and that there was no connection there. It was literally just grinding through some work. So after talking to other Cal State Fullerton alumni, I was told um, that the professor to student ratio was very, very small and there was that personal connection and that's what I wanted. Um, I wanted to gain that network as well and being able to ask any questions that might arise. So that was the second reason I came to Cal State Fullerton was because I have such a close connection with the professors and I feel like I actually have a mentor versus some TA that's just giving me grunt work to do. Um, third and lastly, I, I chose Cal State Fullerton because I wanted a school that had connections for my workforce when I did leave. 
And although you hear these Ivy League schools or anything else, and you think they're connected with big names, Cal State Fullerton has those connections as well. And they're here for you to grab and it's only up to you to make them. For instance, Cal State Fullerton works in conjunction with Google if you're a software developer and they have opportunities for internships and being mentored by real Google engineers. And they also have panelists from Microsoft. So that connection between the school and big tech companies in my field was the third main reason why I wanted to come here because I knew that coming to Cal State Fullerton would allow me the opportunity to interview with these companies and be able to give myself the opportunity to work in the in Fang or some big tech company. And it's been exactly how I expected it. I've been able to interview with Apple, Google, Amazon, all of them because of the connections I've made here with professors and the clubs that I've uh, joined at Cal State Fullerton. So that's the reason why I came here. And then next, if you wanna go with uh, Crystal. Um, I picked Cal State Fullerton because when I toured uh, the campus as a sophomore in high school, um, my avid teacher asked, you know, do you feel like you, is this, is this a school where you can see yourself uh, four years from now? And for me, the Cal State Fullerton was the only campus where I did feel like I could see myself there. Um, it was cost effective. So when I was looking, uh, when I got to senior year and I was accepted to CSUF, um, it was definitely, it was my first choice to begin with, but it was also the most affordable. They have a great engineering program. And as I mentioned uh, early on in the presentation, um, I was looking for a sense of community because um, you know, I did come from a really small town. And um, I also wanted to give, I also wanted to move into a new city that um, I felt like I could also grow. And I feel like I've definitely grown as a person um, at Cal State Fullerton. And uh, I feel like I really made the right choice in doing that. For me, I chose Cal State Fullerton because it's also close to my house. I live in that area and I, I know it very well. So, and I didn't want to move out. So Cal State Fullerton was the closest one to me. And also I really like uh, the programs they have in engineering and any other um, departments. Also, uh, when I visited, I was in senior year, I went twice and I like the connection there. I like um, the programs the counselors uh, offered and how nice they were and they always like promised to help us like through the journey and they always do like whenever I need tutoring or counseling they always there for me and for everyone so I really like that and also it's a small campus and like so they have time for everyone and like they give them all the attention they need thank you our second question is, what do you appreciate most about your experience at Cal State Fullerton? We'll start with Crystal, then Marina, then Ricardo. Uh, Ricardo had mentioned how there are so many opportunities that the school offers, and I agree. Um, I got, um, or I'm a student assistant on campus and I work in IT. Um, and for me, that was, uh, that was a really uh, good way to start getting into um, into IT. Um, and for me, that was a really great experience. Also, uh, dorming my first year, I really liked how uh, there were so many activities, like every single weekend. Um, I also like the, the, the idea of having themed floors in the dorms, uh, because I got to meet so many other engineering students. Um, and I realized that several of them were in my class. And it's been two years since that happened, and I still talk to quite a few of them. Cal State uh, Fullerton offers so many great opportunities, and those are just a, a few of them that I've been able to experience. Um, I agree with what Crystal said. Like, Cal State Fullerton have a lot of uh, opportunities and programs to, to help us. And the most thing I like is have a lot of space for studying on campus and and to do other activities. So it's not just to go on and for your classes, you can do another activity on campus, make friends and connection. And I really like that in school. Cool, cool, cool. 
Um, so for myself personally, what I appreciate the most about my experience at Cal State Fullerton um, is your experience is basically what you make it to be here. It's not a uh, pre preset because you're this major or because you make this much money or because X, Y, Z. So from my personal experience, I've been able to make the most of it. I've been able to network with as many students and as many professors as possible. I've been able to join all the clubs as possible as well and really exponentially grow my professional sense in software engineering um, that would have never been possible in community college. So uh, the thing I, I appreciate most from my experience at Cal State Fullerton is that it offered me the ability and the chance that I don't think I would have been able to receive um, going to any other school. Um, and I, I, I still talk to all my professors and all my uh, classmates um, from the very beginning. And this has been the best decision for me to come here um, versus any other school that I had visited or looked for. Thank you. And our last and third question is, what tips or advice would you give to an incoming freshman at CSUF? And we'll start with Marina, then go to Ricardo, and end with Crystal. I would say that take your time, like in your first year, to make sure like you know what you want to do. And if you're, if you're not sure yet uh, what major you want to do or what field in engineering you 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 like, you can take a uh, GE or uh, 100 engineering courses to decide what you, you really like. So you don't waste time and then switch to another major. So take your time and make sure you like you really enjoy what you're doing and be on the program that you really like. Also, like if you like something, you like something, it's gonna get harder, but stick to it and it like eventually you will go go through it and you will achieve your goal. Cool. So um, for me personally, I wish somebody would have told me this, but um, you as a freshman, I think the best experience, the best advice I can give you is to join as many clubs as you can. Join everything, network with people, create a LinkedIn. You have no idea how important a LinkedIn is for you um, and apply for internships. It, you might feel like you don't know anything and you have no idea, no experience, but that's what makes it so good is that these companies, um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, doesn't matter. They want you raw where they can build you and mold you. And the, the expectations of interviewing is, is such a low standard that your probability of being able to get into one of these as an intern is so high. So don't be discouraged because you're fresh in your major or you're still undecided. Apply to these companies, try and get an internship, make friends with seniors and ask them, hey, if you could have done it all over again, what would you have done? And like I said, join as many clubs as you can, network and don't be afraid to get out there. I know it's a scary world, but it gets easier as you go along and everybody's here to help you. Um, I agree with what Marina and Ricardo said. Um, I think they offer some really great advice. I would also suggest that um, take advantage of your resources. Like there are so many resources on campus, um, the Career Center, for example. Um, I know Ricardo had mentioned that you can always look for opportunities. You can always look for internships. And yes, it is so important to uh, build up your LinkedIn. Um, just, you know, get started with it your, your first year and then just add on to it because you'll see that it's really gonna, it's, you're really gonna add some experience on there. Um, but take advantage of your, of your resources. You know, everybody on campus, like they're there to help you and they want to uh, support you as much as possible on your academic journey at Cal State Fullerton. Um, so take advantage of what you have there um, and what the school has to offer. Well, thank you, Crystal, Marina, and Ricardo. We really appreciate both your presentations and you being a part of this panel. If there are any other questions that any students or parents might have, feel free to contact any of us in the engineering and computer science departments at Cal State Fullerton. Thank you again for your time and we look forward to seeing you on campus.